Wow. You've been shot, Isabella. Sorry about that. Thank you. 
summer off. We're out of summer now that it's fall. Yeah, finally. Exactly. It's summer until October fest. Then it's fall. Right. Midweek is this Wednesday at noon, followed by a light luncheon. Table talk is this Thursday at 7, followed by talking and having libations of some sort or another. Bible classes continue as intended, etc. Thursday, no, Thursday, we have a pancake breakfast coming up. Um, and before we talk about that, Pastor Meyer, speak. Yeah. yeah. Next, week, next week, your um, Lincoln Hills Bible study will be correct at the Sorelli's home. Oh, okay. But we're at the Thompson's home this week. Okay. So Thompson's this week, Sorelli's after that. Yes. Thank you. Maybe I should just leave the location off and let people find it. <laughs> Norb, are you in here? He's over here. There he is. Speak, oh Norb. Yeah. I'm uh, a refugee from Southern California. I went to the church in Torrance. We had a tough breakfast for 12 years, and I wanted to bring it up here. Um, it just uh, was a wonderful um, opportunity to reach out to the community. So all the, all the mailboxes will have five tickets in them next Sunday, um, and you're not obligated to uh, you know, pay for the tickets, or you can make a donation to cover the cost of the breakfast. But use these tickets to reach out to your friends. It's a, a real non-threatening uh, way to invite your friends to come and get to know uh, Holy Cross. Um, we started, started building the numbers, and we got up to five or 600. Uh, down there, and it was uh, it was just a wonderful activity. So, um, we'll, uh, you'll get more information in your mailboxes next Sunday. But it's just a great time. So wonderful. Yes. Are great. you thinking about keeping it going through the morning as a work party? Uh, yeah, we have a work party every Wednesday. Just, just <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Wednesday, but. <Hey. coughs> Work and play. Is yes. this, um, are you doing anything, and if not, could I um, maybe enlist some youth to Canvas Neighborhood and Pass Out Flyers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's been, we've done that in the past, too, and we've invited um, anybody we can. Um, and it, it's just a, just a real wonderful, and people uh, love to eat. And uh, yeah. it's a great, it's a great breakfast. I think you're going to fit in just fine around here. Yeah. <laughs> I should I should add that uh, while while we're at it that Norb uh, Norb is our our uh, new property coordinator and he's been helping with all kinds oh, of don't uh, tell little, anybody that I know <laughs> don't tell anybody that um, he's been helping with all kinds of little and big uh, projects along the way you saw we moved the mailboxes um, if you can't find your mail it's because we moved them did you all figure that out um, I guess we're going to call that new room the mail room unless a, unless another uh, should we call it the epistle room, maybe? I don't know. Um, but uh, but Norb is very instrumental in helping with that. Thank you. And all sorts of other little and big projects. Uh, Jack Strobel asked me to um, uh, ask if anyone is interested in helping with ushering. Please talk to uh, uh, to talk to Jack. If, uh, if you don't know who Jack is, you can talk to me, and I will pass, pass your name uh, along. We have a, uh, a faithful crew of ushers. Um, it's not a super big crew of ushers, and we could, uh, we could use a few more people in the rotation. So if you, are, uh, if you are interested in helping, that would be great. I had a, uh, a, a one of our lovely parishioners, whose name I won't mention, but it, but it, uh, it rhymes with Susie Ward. <laughs> <laughs> If you have ever, uh, if you have ever see, uh, kind of looked, snuck up and looked in the pulpit, you'll see that I had kind of printed up there uh, <coughs> to say, "Sir, we would see Jesus." This is very common in many, many pulpits, kind of around uh, around the world. And so she had this made in a, in a wood 
uh, and put there. So thank you, Susie. And so that's kind of what I see. That's what I see when I get into the pulpit. Sir, we would see Jesus. Look what we found <laughs> hiding in a closet. <laughs> this is the uh, the this is the sixth stained glass window uh, that has been hiding in the sacristy for 25 years. 26, 20. Seven years. I know this isn't a super great picture of it, but you can kind of see that this is a this is an open, a Bible and a stole, you know, like the pastor wears, and a shepherd's and a shepherd's crook. So this is for um, the office of the ministry or for um, forgiveness, absolution, and uh, and so one of the things that we're kind of uh, scheming on is there are two or three different ways that we could do something with this. Um, one option is to cut a hole in the wall, you know, between the sanctuary and the hallway where, uh, where it would go and, and just sort of put it in place exactly like the other two that are on that, the organ side of the sanctuary. Um, the, the difference is, is that the hallway side, of course, has a little bit less light because it's inside instead of outside. But even on those outside ones, we've got the, the overhang, so it's quite shaded, so those are never as bright as on the is on the other side of the building. Uh, another possibility is to work out some kind of backlighting, perhaps. Um, maybe mount it. It looks like at one point the thought was to mount it directly on the wall um, and not inset it. Well, that's what it looks like, Pastor. <laughs> so. That's just because Ed Fogarty okified everything, and he okified the frame. It was meant to be punch a hole in the wall and yep. make it look like the other five. All right. See, there you go. We have the sacred history of the past on. So anyway, we're kind of uh, we're kind of scheming on that and thinking about how might we uh, how might we do that in a way that's gonna it's gonna work because it's beautiful and it's just a shame to have it hiding out. Next year is our 30th anniversary, so uh, uh, so we gotta start sprucing things up around here. So that would be one. Yeah, nor get to work. <laughs> Pastor, can I interrupt real quick? I, sure. I'm sorry. My, my Sunday school class was waiting to me. And I oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Yeah, I know you did. That's okay. I just want to say a big thank you to everybody for coming last night to the Oktoberfest. It was a huge success for all of you who were there. You know that. Tell everyone else that they really missed something fun, so they'll come next year. We had about 100 people there, and it was just you know, it was so fun, and what was really neat is the youth mm -hmm. who were doing an awful lot of the work there were saying, this was so much fun, mm -hmm. you know, and the parents of the youth who were doing an awful lot of the work there said, this was so much fun. It was fun for us who were doing it, and that was great. And I won't give you actual numbers yet because we don't have all the actuals, but it looks like we did, at least we exceeded our goal, but we definitely made our goal of $1,000 wow. of great wow. We will let you know the, the actuals when we get them all everything. And that's between the donation and the purchases of the beer glasses. Are there any beer glasses? There are a few of the beer glasses left if you didn't get one and would like to still get one. They're really cool and we're probably going to do that every year with different gear or different color but it's, they're really, they turned out so neat and we're so excited that that really worked out. <coughs> So, and thank you to and You everybody. don't have to drink beer out of the beer bottle. No, they actually work to drink other things out of too. <laughs> In fact, they may work better. You might not ship them as well. So, <laughs> so thank you again to everybody for coming and helping and everything. Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, in your mailbox in our new mail room, you will find a copy of an article that I had published in. Uh, this month's issue of the Lutheran Witness, and I'd just like to share, and so I'm sharing that with you. It was on uh, on uh, titled Luther's Dark Days on Fechtungen, Affliction, and Clinical Depression. Fechtung is a, is a nifty German word that means something between suffering, spiritual, dis spiritual distress, and affliction. Uh, it's kind of a hard word to translate, but uh, but that's uh, that's what the article was on. And if you're yeah. interested, you have a copy of it in your mailbox. I'm going to pass around this this issue of the Lutheran Witness. How many of you subscribe to Lutheran Witness? Okay, a few. I would suggest if you don't do so, to um, uh, to consider doing so. It really is a good magazine. This 
uh, this month's issue is on, um, on ministry and mental health, you know, which is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart personally. Um, and, and it's a nice, uh, nice article that has various, uh, various pieces on mental health and pastors and church workers. Uh, so you can take a look at that around the way. What's the name of that picture before it was cut off? I haven't the faintest idea. I wasn't in charge of the art. I just wrote the words. You'd think I should know, but I, I do definitely know how to find it. So I'll, I'll find out for you, though, Larry. All right, here's a couple. Rick, would you mind turning the lights off real quick? Just a couple pictures from the Oktoberfest last night. Here we go. Yes, we had, uh, uh, we had uh, all kinds of fun, mostly outside this year. Last year, we did it in November, and so it was a lot darker and colder, and so half the people were inside, but this year was really gorgeous. Uh, so we were able to do it. <laughs> I don't really like how it looks like Catherine is sort of doing a little sort of charismatic praying there. But, uh, but know, the, the kids did a lot of a lot of dancing, and there were even some adults that did uh, uh, that did dancing. So it was a super uh, super fun time, and uh, I'm going to guess there are about 100 people there between children and adults. Something, something like that. So, yeah, no, it's yeah, super fun. Pastor, yes. One of, and Catherine kind of commented on it, but I think one of the things that this event each year is a great thing is it. Sometimes it's hard to mix with the kids and find ways to let them know that we see them and hear them. Right, <laughs> right. And this event is really a, a great opportunity for that. Yep. No, I totally, I totally agree. And uh, and it was a, it was a lot of fun. So thank you, Anne. And uh, I'm sure we will do it again next year. Um, so I gotta go through the whole so again. Sorry. Um, Michelle Nenek is uh, has a little box. Where's your box, Michelle? There it is. Uh, and this box is for uh, seminary students. Uh, thank you, Rick, or uh, Dennis. Um, seminary students who. Uh, uh, have ex kind of expenses around Christmas time, either for traveling home to see family, or for um, uh, or for gifts for their children, or whatever. And so the, sem the Fort Wayne Seminary is asking people to uh, donate gift cards um, or monies uh, to help us, particularly with Christmas for our seminary students. Where is that box going to be, Michelle? What do you think? Like in the mail room? Is De well, Deaconess Pam, we're kind of trying to decide. That, where do you, wherever you That's where you I see start. It, when you see it, put your card in. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there's the box. <laughs> and, uh, and there's also a list of some suggested gift cards. And if you put money monies in, then we'll just buy gift cards with that. You can write the check out the Holy Cross, and we'll figure it out from there. All right. Very good. Any other announcements? We had a lot. I'm sorry about that. All right. Let's get on to Matthew chapter 26 and continue on our way. We are at verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where do you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So the Passover is the, is the, feast, of, the feast of unleavened bread. Um, how often was the Passover? Once a year, yeah, once a year. This is one of the big festivals where many of the Jews from around the Mediterranean basin would try to come, uh, come home to Jerusalem. Uh, the other big, the other big feast is um, is Pentecost. So it's 50 days after, uh, after Passover. So we'll kind of get a replay of this a little bit later. Um, so this is this is coming up, and they're starting to plan for their. Uh, plan for where they're going to have the meal 
uh, but they're sort of itinerant. They're traveling around. They don't have a home base, as it were. So go into the city. What city is that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yep, definitely. Go to the go to the city um, uh, to keep the Passover. Go to the city and say to a certain man, who is the certain man? Yeah, don't know. It's a certain man. <laughs> that, that's uh, that's what the text says. I'm not even aware of any traditions behind knowing who this person is. Well, there. Yeah, exactly. So so they were so they were to go to this person and uh, and say the teacher, the rabbi says, my time, my time is at hand, which is a very interesting phrase. I think we hear. We hear lots of interesting phrases or expressions in the Bible about about time, and this is a and this is a good example of this. Where my time, my time for what? My time for my for my death, for my uh, my suffering, my time to die on the cross for the sins of the world. My own Passover is at hand, as it were. So Jesus comes <coughs> comes to here and. And one of the things that is very interesting about kind of how this all works in Matthew is the is this notion of of time that Jesus is Jesus is the new Adam doing completing fulfilling what Adam is unable to do. Jesus is also the new Israel, so he is all of God's people, kind of wrapped up into one. And so so here Jesus keeps the keeps the Passover. And so we get lots of lots of these images or pictures of of who he is and how the the timing of all of these things line up just exactly as God intends. Now think of that uh, uh, think of that very famous verse from Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might be we might be adopted as sons. So this is the fullness, the fullness of time. The God's, God's timing, I think, is an interesting one along the way. Um, he also uses this phrase, I will keep the Passover. I will, uh, I will keep the Passover at your house with my, just with my disciples. I will, um, keeping the Passover means actually doing what they were given to do. When? When did God institute the Passover? Moses, yep. Exodus chapter twelve. We get, um, we get, and this is so. I know, just gotta kind of get this into your <laughs> into your brain a little bit, and remember the Sunday school lineup of things. That this is the tenth plague. This is the plague of the firstborn, and that and that God instructs Moses that they are to take a lamb, one year old, without spot or blemish. And that they are to sacrifice it, and that they are to put the blood on the on the doorposts and on the lintel over the door. And that they are to, uh, and that they are to eat the eat the lamb in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And then there are some other um, traditions that kind of rise up out of that later on. Um, one of those is the the tradition of the Seder meal. Which we'll uh, which we'll talk about as we move forward through this chapter a little bit. Larry, the lamb without spot or blemish. Does it give uh, give examples of what a spot or blemish would be? Uh, a, phys a physical imp a physical imperfection. So that's, col uh, that's coloring, what I mean. none of that. Discol discoloring certainly some kind of um, uh, certainly some kind of uh, physical any kind of physical disfigurement. You know, if there's a if the if, the, if there's a uh, a, a limb that is lame or something like that, then it's not without spot or blemish. But if it was perfectly black, perfectly white, it, it doesn't... Uh, I don't remember anything. Todd Pastor, do you remember? I don't remember anything about color, but 
but they rather than it white. is. They can't be black. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. the argument I had with the Jewish man. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, black lambs were considered <laughs> okay. Yeah, If I were to guess, I would have said white. But um, and that would and that would sort of make sense, you know. Again, you think of Isaiah 52, 53. Yeah, anyway, any imperfection yeah. that would disqualify it for the Winchester uh, sheep show. Okay. <laughs> exactly. This all, right. so all about the Winchester sheep show. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I wonder about it. Yeah. Um, this is a just a just a peek at our at our rabbit trail. But, uh, but I found an interesting one. Um, in my studies with my Roman Catholic friends, I don't remember how this came up, but kind of through our, through our conversation, um, they, uh, they uh, just almost as a side note, um, noted someone that they had a priest friend that had been uh, injured uh, in a fire and was disfigured and therefore couldn't be a priest anymore. Yeah. And, and I was kind of like, what? <laughs> and, and basically, um, and, and I, don't, I don't know the history of this, of this practice, but basically, uh, at least in my understanding of Roman Catholicism, is, is that the, the, um, the priest cannot have any, any physical disfigurements either. So um, missing, a, missing a limb, on a, you know, a, some, kind, some kind of physical blemish, or something, uh, which I thought was very interesting because I've never, and I'm not aware of, of any of, of anything in that of that tradition kind of going over into into Lutheranism, and I have no clue on what the background is. Do you know, Pastor? I don't know the background, but it did bleed over into Lutheranism. Okay. Um, as recently as the 80s, when a pastor, because of diabetes, now became wheelchair bound. And the elder said, according to what they understand, he can't leave the service anymore with this disfigurement. Right. Interesting. And so went through and we couldn't find anything that would disqualify him. So they modified the altar and everything sure. for Pastor Moon to serve at Bethany and Longboat. That makes sense. Well and it and it is kind of a, I think an interesting challenge because there are some actual physical things that pastors have to be able to do it would be very difficult for me to be a pastor um, if I couldn't talk. <laughs> I mean, I could serve a deaf congregation, right? But, I, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a part of it. It would be very difficult for me to do if I, if I couldn't actually physically, physically distribute the elements. Or um, I, have a, I have another pastor friend that right now is, is wrestling with the fact that he had a, he had a stroke. And he's unable to read. So he can preach, but he can't read. <laughs> so, it's, so it's sort of, an in, it, I think, an interesting, an interesting little challenge of, so what does it mean to serve in this place? And recognizing that there are actual qualifications that you do have to be able to do things. And if you're unable to do those things, um, then, then what does it actually mean? Dave. Yeah, um so is it a pragmatic thing, or is it more uh, like the, the priest serving in the in the uh, in persona priest? Uh, my impression is that it is partly pragmatic, but th but that it is more historically theological. That because the because the priest stands in the in the person or in the place of Christ, that there can't be a a physical imperfection now. I have all kinds of questions about that, <laughs> and and, uh, and and things about so what what is the perfect weight? You know, am I disqualified because of my receding hairline? You know, what, so what does that actually? Uh, what does that? And I don't know. I, I don't have the answers to those. Well, yeah. I think about Christ, right? Who even after his resurrection had his wounds right. in his hands, feet, and side. So it, it seems right. So it doesn't make it doesn't make a lot of theological sense to to, to to kind of push push that over far. And also, again, looking at those, thinking about those Isaiah verses about how um, uh, how how he is. I don't remember the exact language, but it's basically he is nothing, 
nothing special to look at. And when I think of physical perfection, I would think that that's something to look at. I would think that that's something that you would notice. And so I, I really, I don't, I don't know, but I, but I found that a, a, an interesting kind of, hmm, where does that go? Larry. Oh, I was just, uh, I was just kind of thinking about scarification on the uh, tattoos, you know. Right. I'm, I'm soggy around the waist, you know. Right. I like that phrase. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and again, what does what does physical perfection mean, right. etc. Et so I don't know. It's uh, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Well, right. And and there's always this this thing when it comes to when it when it comes to the the pastor and the and the, the preaching. And this is not unique to pastors, of course. And, and that is, is that what you say is more important than, uh, than, than your own personal qualifications or disqualifications, right? But how you say something does matter. You know, if I yell, Jesus loves you! <laughs> you know right, that is not communicating the love of Jesus, right? So how we do things does actually communicate. Um, and, and so that's kind of, I think the, the interesting interplay of those is where does, you know, kind of what we say, what we do, uh, how, how we act, how we behave, how do those things affect, uh, affect the message of the gospel? Yeah, Mary. I understand if you can and cannot do your job anymore, but isn't there always the, the whole wedding garment? Right. That's right. So it doesn't matter what you look like. Right. You have the wedding garment. Right. And and I think that too, what what's interesting about that is, is that what I'm talking about is not a qualification for salvation issue. Right? Because there are all kinds of things in the scriptures about, about what pastors are to do and not do in terms of qualifications that have nothing to do with whether or not you're saved. And that's that's really tremendously important to recognize. <laughs> is is that we're not talking about salvation there, but it, I do think that it raises some interesting questions for us. Just about what does it mean to what is the relationship between what we say and do, how we behave, how we act, and the words that we say. Arden and then Lee. Uh, what comes to mind here is that they're on a mission to do something, but they have a task to do, but a distraction. Of a person, sure, could change all that. Sure, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And so you have, so all of those things can kind of, can kind of. I'll, I'll give you an example. This is, this is not a, a, a question of sin. All right, um, I was, I was taught when I was in seminary that you never wear a watch when you're leading the service. Okay, so you will, so you will see that I will never have my watch on when I'm leading the service, and if I do. It is a fluke and is probably freaking me out <laughs> because I because I forgot to take it off and uh, and and my uh, my instructor uh, his his answer to that was this is uh, this is God's sight this is God's time <laughs> not your time and so the and so the time can kind of serve as a as an easy distraction of kind of what's go, what's going on. And so I've just made it a practice for 25 years of taking my watch off when I'm when I'm doing when I'm doing services. Um, that's not a question of sin. That's a question of of, uh, of kind of practicality for myself as much as for anybody else. Now uh, Levi and then Barbara. I, I just had a question, sorry this is kind of related, but to the on the uh, the certain man. Um, and it reminded me of in, I think the last passage we had, where it was was it a certain woman? Uh huh. Um, and you know, I've, I've actually read on that why you know people are always like, well, why is she anonymous? Why is she being kept anonymous? Right. right. And you know, some people will say, well, they, maybe the author didn't know who it was or couldn't remember. Or maybe right. here the author didn't know. But is there a bigger purpose for why uh, Matthew is keeping these? Keeping, anonymous. keeping them anonymous. I think it. Uh, I, I would actually 
put that on its ear a little bit and say it's not it, it's not that um, that Matthew is is trying to keep them anonymous, but it's that Matthew is pointing out that there is a purpose, there is a particular person who is serving in this role, so that this is not. And they grab some guy off the street, but it is that they 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 were to go to a certain man, a specific person. That that's always been my read of that read of that question. Before. Barbara, um, this was just a silly remark. It's distracting you where I watch. It's very distracting when you're preaching. You have somebody go like that. But yeah, are we done yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My uh, my home church, my uh, my pastor growing up was kind of a long preacher, and uh, and and the elders had a clock installed on the back wall. <laughs> <laughs> totally serious. So so that the so that the preacher and anybody else could could look and see what time it was. So when people started turning around and looking at the clock, you knew it was time to get get on. <laughs> Howard than Larry. Uh, talking about a thing that's figured, if you walk out from under the mantle of your baptism, yes, and you have one unforgiven sin, you're worse than disfigured. You are the walking dead. You are the walking dead. You're a zombie. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd use the word zombie, but um, well, and and there and there you do get your baptismal covering is, of course, what qualifies you because this is what this is what has cleansed you and washed you in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So to go outside your baptism is uh, and or to reject the gift of gifts that God has given you baptism is certainly very, very dangerous business and I and I uh, I concur. Alright, I'm gonna go on. So I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples and the disciples did as Jesus had had it directed to them, and they prepared. And they prepared the Passover. So this is a specific meal in a specific place with a specific person, a specific group of people, and is prepared in a particular way. Okay, so all of these things kind of fit together to say this is how God is going to work in this place at this time. It's very. It's very explicit that they are given instructions on on what to do and how to do it. So there was no question about what it meant to prepare the Passover at that time. Nobody wondered what to do or how to do it. That was that was clear. And so they are going to do this. They're going to do this in this. Uh, uh, I don't think we we don't get the word upper room here, but. But we, you know, we hear elsewhere that this is in the upper room, and then they are going to gather in that place. Can I go on? Yes. Did please. they also sacrifice a lamb for that Passover meal? You know, that's not um, listed in the text, but they certainly would have had to go to the temple, have the lamb sacrificed, and then bring it back to the meal. This is a part of why the temple is such a busy place. <laughs> And, and how uh, when it gets close to Passover, especially these day or two days, I don't know if there's any instructions on the time between when the lamb is sacrificed and when it's actually if it has to be the same day. I would think so. It's not like they have you know, some sort of, they don't have a refrigeration process or something. So I would think it would have to be the same day. This is why you get the, uh, the, the Kidron River, the Kidron Brook kind of runs red <laughs> on the day of preparation is because of all of the blood from the sac from the sacrifices of these lambs that would uh, that would drain down. So the number that I have that I have sticking in my head, although honestly I don't remember where I got it from, was that we were looking at upwards of twenty thousand lambs sacrificed on this day. So that's a lot of lambs and a lot of blood. So, so this is very, very um, messy business. That's that's for sure. And, th and this is one of the things. Just at a very 
practical level that I, that I think of as so culturally different for us from, uh, from temple worship is temple worship was very visceral. When I, was a, when I was a kid, one of the places I grew up in, before we settled, we moved to St. Louis when I was 10. Before that, one of the places that, uh, that we lived was in um, Greeley, Colorado. Greeley, Colorado, among other things, is famous for the uh, Monsanto meatpacking plant. It's the largest meatpacking plant in the country. And so, if you've got the right breeze, wow, <laughs> it was all defining, let's say. <clears throat> and, and so, temple worship between the sights, the sounds, and the movements, and the sacrifices, and the, and the fire, and the blood, and all of this stuff is, is, is going to seem and feel feel a lot more like, I don't know, something between a butcher shop and a meat packing plant, and you can kind of think, oh, I'm really glad they had incense, because <laughs> they kind of needed it. It was very practical. So, so this is, that's what I mean to say, this is a much more um, full sensory experience than what we have. I'm not suggesting we need to start sacrificing lambs. We have Jesus need to do so. <clears throat> but, um, but I am fascinated by how there was just no question when he went into the temple that there is a cost for the forgiveness of sins. Because you can see it, you can smell it, <laughs> it's everywhere. <clears throat> is there a hand? Oh. Well, it's just when I was commenting, the life and death. Yeah. yeah. Death that, for sin. Ooh. Yeah, that this is a life and death matter. But this is not just, um, this is not kind of a, a, very, a nice and sanitary thing that just, uh, that just happens. All right, any questions? Can I go on? All right. When it was evening, so this all happened earlier in the day. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. <clears throat> so we get a bunch of, uh, bunch of words in here. First off, recline. And I use chairs this time. The, um, if you've ever eaten at a, a traditional uh, Japanese restaurant, it's, it's going to be very low to the ground. And that's going to be closely, at least, or certainly if you've eaten at a, a Middle Eastern, a traditional Middle Eastern. <coughs> here, it's, it's, and for us Westerners, it's kind of uncomfortable. You know, how, do I, how do I eat? And it's, it's just not very practical for us. We just kind of, look, we don't work that way. I don't, unless there's a TV, then I can eat anything. <laughs> TV, I can figure out how to eat, but otherwise, this reclining a table becomes very, uh, it, it's very odd for us. And and they would most likely have all been on one side of the table. Why? So that someone can serve them. So if you were to look at this, you know, you kind of think. Well, it was very convenient for them to all sit on the same side of the table for the painting. <laughs> and, and well, obviously, there's a lot of things about this that probably are, are that obviously are not intended to look like first century. The notion. So, if you look at, um, I, I know this better from from Greek and Roman uh, things than from than from this. But if you were to go to Rome, 
or to or to Greece and you were to visit, they would uh, the you're going to have tables that are going to be in like a, a U or a half a half moon, this kind of thing, so that servers will be on one side and then all of the and all of the others because it would be very uncouth to have a server actually reach over your shoulder and put something down. So so while it wouldn't be wouldn't be this, that's not as far out as we would probably make it to be. Larry. The two female looking figures, one on each and the right and the left of Jesus. Who are they supposed to represent? Oh, I don't remember. I did not look I did not look that up. And of course that's uh, that is one of the interesting and peculiar things from sixteenth century Renaissance art is um, is that to our eyes they look um, they look a lot more effeminate than than uh, than we would than we would expect. But that isn't really a rabbit trail. That is an art history rabbit trail. When I'm not going down that road. No, it's a good it is a good question. But I'm but I'm not going to try to answer that one right now. Mary. So there was a lot of guilty consciences <laughs> in that room. <laughs> Does look that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Is it I? Is it I, Lord? Yeah. And which is which is sort of interesting because you know why are they asking this if they you know if they haven't kind of had this thought of betrayal already some way or another you know? and, and so either yeah they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another is it I and um, and, and so they recognize the betrayal I think it's also interesting that they don't say. Is it him? <laughs> right? <laughs> or they don't say, is it you? <laughs> you know, they're not pointing the finger at each other, either to Jesus or, you know, about Jesus. But they are, uh, but the, the law is kind of doing its work here and saying, is it, is it I? Because that is the, that is the implied question behind me. One of you will, one of you will betray me. That's the implied question is, and which one of you is it? Is sort of the is sort of the question there, Barbara. I always thought that was kind of strange too that they would ask when they know. Then I thought, well, maybe they also were saying, do you suppose I could inadvertently betray you, like we do something, right. say something, sure. or do something that right. seems right. to go against the faith, or, or you know, what's the thing, loose lips sink ships, <laughs> right? I mean, is this accidental, even? Or um, or out of weakness, which I think is what you're talking about a little bit more. But that's all kind of a part of the implied question. Andy and then Mary. Well, we know that the disciples were always the sharpest <coughs> in the world. Yeah. Um, but by this time, surely they must have <coughs> recognized that Jesus knew things before they were going to happen, he knew things. But there's no way they could know. And I would think that would kind of uh, put the, shall we say, fear of God. And sure. <laughs> One would think. One would so think. they would wonder, oh, oh boy, what did I do? Or right, what, what, what did I do, or what am I going to do? Exactly. Right, one of you is going to betray me. How does, how does he know that? <clears throat> yep, that's a good question. Mary. But isn't this the reason we go to the communion room? Is we bring our sins to sure. be forgiven in the blood of Christ. Sure. Of so course. this is this is the lesson to all of us. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> is um. And where which uh, which which Psalm is it? Uh, who can O oh Lord? Who can number their sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Um, which is actually a, a I think a tremendously comforting Psalm to to know that God God forgives even the sins of which I am not aware. Even the sins that I don't know or can't articulate, God forgives even those. Pastor, then Larry, then Diane. All of the gospel accounts show the disciples getting dumber the more that Jesus teaches. Yeah. Mark <laughs> is particularly sharp on that yep. because the more he teaches, the blinder they become. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't have this. They don't. They don't have a good track record when it comes to progression. 
the, the ladder is not going up. The ladder is going, you know, it's more like a, an, an escalator going down or something, something like that. Um, Larry, then Diane. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a great interest. Um, what, how are we, how are we looking, are we even trying to integrate the Dead Sea Scrolls from 1947 into this? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls they, don't, they, have any, the don't have any now. New Testament <laughs> material. They're, they only have Old Testament material. So right, that's actually pretty that. easy for us to do. <laughs> in that, in that, because there's no, you know, there isn't a Dead Sea Scroll Matthew or something. But do that. You've got uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls have old uh, fragments of Old Testament documents, and and then they have fragments or larger pieces of of kind of intertest I'll call it intertestamental literature in there. Um, some of which, uh, most most of which is not um, it, uh, it is not held as authoritative by anybody. So I would say, in general, no, we don't. Uh, I mean, in, in, in terms of the Old Testament material, what it actually does is, um, is validates the text that we have. Because all of, and I know, this really is a rabbit trail, and it's Larry's And it's time. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's OK. Um, yeah, everyone was trying to look at a clock for me. But uh, <laughs> I will. Um, I will I will try to answer that next week. Okay. So we'll we'll start with that next week. Or talk later. Yeah, or talk or talk later. Um, last announcement, Diane. Yeah, you had your hand up before, please. Well, I was thinking Judas took communion. So well, actually, that is not clear at all in the text. So we're going to get to that. Um. <laughs> so yeah, we will. Add, trust me, we will get to that because that is a tremendously important question. Um, so we will. So we will get to that. We haven't got there in the text yet. So I will answer that. Um, last thing, and then I'll then the benediction. Uh, anybody that ordered the uh, He Restores My Soul book and did not get them because we didn't have the last box, we have the last box. You can talk to Pam about it afterwards. Box is in my office. I have it. You got it. OK, that's fine. <laughs> Let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you all. Amen. Amen. All right.